All right, so Conservation Northwest began our Sage Lands Heritage Program in 2017. This is something we talked about for years leading up to that point. And as we looked at the landscape of Southern British Columbia and Washington, there was a lot of work being done in the North Cascades by us and other groups, a lot of work being done in Southern BC's coast range and inland temperate rainforests, great groups on the Washington coast and really across the state. But one of the things we identified was a need to promote landscape scale conservation and habitat restoration working lands protection, and species recovery in the central part of our state, in the shrub steppe habitat, or as we like to call them, the sage lands. And so we initiated a sage lands heritage program to help protect, connect, and restore this landscape. And Jay Keeney, who's based up in OMAC, um, took over the role of leading that effort up. And so Jay, do you want to give us a little bit more information about the sage lands heritage program to kick things off? And I'll, um, I'll click through the slides either when it feels like the right time or whatever you tell me to. All right, uh, thank you, Chase. And thank you all for joining. I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to be uh, in this position of Sage Lands Heritage Program lead for our organization. It's a big area, it's a big challenge, but to me it's home. It's, uh, I grew up in Eastern Washington, worked a lot with farmers and ranchers in this area in my career with the Department of Ag. So this was like a, a fit for me. I get to come back into areas that I really appreciate and, and can, can use our assistance. The first thing we did looking at the Sage Lands Heritage Program is realize there's a lot of partners already out there working, doing great things, whether it's on sage grouse or mule deer, but we wanted to serve as that kind of a catalyst organization that can come in and help get things done that may have slowed down or bogged down or just need a little, a little help, a little kick. And uh, so we put together groups of a lot of partners that looked at the whole area from the north to the central to the south. And we decided to focus in on basically the east slope of the Cascades shrub step communities. This map depicts that. It also shows in the brighter orange colors the, where the number of species and how they are very um, dependent on these connectivity pathways between zones of safer habitat um, there's these zones that are pinch points that need um, special attention. Using these types of products from Arid Lands Initiatives had developed a lot of science-based maps that showed us where are we gonna focus? If we have limited resources, limited time, limited energy and or funds, um, where can we do the best work and get the most done? And we felt looking at this map, there was about seven areas or, or connectivity zones that we could focus in on and, and put more effort into it and see which ones played out as the best place to use our time and energy. So we have uh, seven there. There's Okanagan to Kalamaka up in Canada, because we don't recognize the border because wildlife doesn't recognize the border. Well, we recognize it, but we, we uh, work up the north if we need to. Uh, Transboundary Okanagan, working for Wildlife Initiative, Dyer Hill, Sagebrush Flats to Big Bend, Kalakam to Yakima Firing Center, and the Weenas to the Yakima Reservation. So these were the types of areas that we could focus in on. And there's barriers between these uh, pockets of shrub step habitat or even large areas of shrub step habitat that are particularly important. And that's what we've tried to do is work with this group of partners that are already on the ground, getting a lot of good work done and try to come in and help, whether it be um, help on a conservation easement or a land acquisition, a release of different species like sharp-tailed grouse, work with state agencies, federal agencies, federal programs, local landowners, um, and try to just be that catalyst type of organization. In that, in that envelope, what we call the connected backbone, backbone which runs north to south in, through eastern Washington, um, of course there's a uh, shrub step over closer to Spokane or closer to the, further to the east. But we're, we kind of needed to focus on an area that we had the capacity to deal with. And we already were focused on that in a working for wildlife program um, right here on the map. It shows this zone coming through just north of OMAC between OMAC and Tenasket, where there's a big focus of wildlife that need to move through there to maintain the connectivity between the, basically the Cascades and, and the Rockies or the Kettle Mountain Range um, to begin with. So this is a map that depicts then different uh, transition zones, different connectivity areas and how wildlife, if we wanna keep wildlife healthy um, and to survive some of the changes that might be coming at them with climate change and whatnot, they need to be able to move through a permeable landscape. 
one of those areas that was a particular focus. Oh, I saw Chase wanting to ask me. Yeah, a I just wanted to note really quick for folks: all of these maps that we're showing are available on our website. It can be a little bit hard to see them on Zoom, so if you want to go onto our website under the Sagelands Heritage Program page, or we even have a, a special page designated just to Cascades to Rockies connections, you can find larger versions of these maps and a little bit of information about the the biological and other survey data that went into them. Um, that's available there. And then if you have any questions, just a reminder, please go ahead and put those in the chat or into the Zoom question and answer box. And I'm monitoring that as well as some of our other staff and we'll be happy to answer your questions as best we can. So, sorry to interrupt, Jake, go for it. Oh, no problem. Um, what I'm gonna talk about now on the map is that arrow that goes from like Winthrop north of Riverside on the on the left hand side over towards Colville and that area is the focus of the working for wildlife uh, initiative that we've been working on for several years working with a lot of great people conservation districts uh, land trusts and we're really just trying to increase the capacity of all those organizations um, to, to keep this working uh, working landscape um, possible with the wildlife needs and permeability in place um, as part of that project, we saw right away that there's going to be, these are some of the species that are um, in, in uh, the area. We also saw that there's a tremendous amount of, of wildlife and primarily deer along safe or along Highway 97 between uh, Riverside and Tenasket. So we initiated a Safe Passage 97 project with our partners Mule Deer Foundation. Um, there has been a, so many people have helped on this to make it happen and we're going to talk more about that a little later. Um, I think we have some time set aside just for that talk, but this is just to kind of show you how the Safe Passage 97 project is really um, part of, and as a, in a bigger scheme of things, the Sagelands Heritage Program. It's just one of the very important crossing zones that occurs in the Sagelands Heritage Project area. Great, Jay, do you want me to go into the video now or would you like to talk a little bit more about the Connected Backbone as a whole or some of the other projects you're working on? I can talk just real quickly on the Connected Backbone, other projects. So some of the things that you're looking at when trying to keep connectivity available for, for these species, there's pygmy rabbits, sharp-tailed grouse, sage grouse, deer, badgers, mule deer, uh, you know, then uh, uh, some of the predators, uh, bobcats and, and coyotes. But to keep it all um, available for them, you've got to be looking at ways to protect that habitat. That can be protected from development. So that's where your easements, your um, acquisitions might come into play. You can protect it from fire. We've been working on projects to try to help have a better attack on initial fire responses to prevent huge mega fires. We recognize that some fire is good, but sometimes too big, too much, and burning too hot can really cause some problems in, in sagebrush country. Um, you can protect it in terms of the, the land and obstacles that animals might find in the way as they try to get from one area to another. And that can be roads. So we have projects that are decommissioning or closing unnecessary roads um, in some of the forested areas, um, as well as that lead into sagebrush country. And then we have projects that take out other barriers, such as barbed wire fences that aren't in use anymore. That can be a huge detriment to flying species such as sharp-tailed grouse or sage grouse. And I can't tell you how many deer um, I've seen hung up in barbed wire fences as they try to cross and get their back legs hot, caught in them. So we try to have different volunteer groups or even contracts that go out to remove some of these derelict barbed wire fences. There's other, other projects we're working on to improve the amount of wetlands in the, in the uh, arid land region, building small structures that help uh, store more water and create more wet meadows and wetland areas. Thank you, Jay, and thanks to everyone else that just joined us. Looks like a bunch of folks have hopped on since we got started. We're talking about Conservation Northwest Sagelands Heritage Program in Central Washington State, and we're gonna talk a little bit more now about the Safe Passage 97 project, which is one component of the Sagelands Program. It's something that our organization and partners have identified as a critical need going all the way back to around 2013, and even before that, as a, a key connectivity zone in the Okanagan Valley where you had mule deer and other species getting hit and killed on Highway 97. And it really was a critical spot in the Cascades to Rockies corridor, in the connected backbone that you just saw a 
map of, that area running north to south, east of the Cascades. This was a major pinch point, and given the amount of wildlife loss that was occurring on the highway, the risks to motorist safety, we wanted to do something about it. And unfortunately, after several years of advocacy, the state legislature in Olympia, despite local support, had not allocated funding for the Safe Passage 97 project. WashDOT was on board, our State Department of Transportation. We had support from the Colville tribes and local legislators, Okanagan County commissioners. Jay was, was really leading the charge along with some of his allies at the Mule Deer Foundation. But despite all that support, the legislature wasn't providing money for the project. And we decided to see what we could do to kickstart it using private funds. Before I share a video about a, a pretty big milestone for that first private phase, Jay, is there anything else you want to add about the Safe Passage 97 project? Uh, you did a great job of displaying it, Chase. I just would like to add that um, the importance of this project was it, it brought a lot of community people together. It brought a lot of organizations into a focus on one area um, that we could do something even though we weren't able to get the big dollars to move ahead with big underpasses and, and lots of miles of fencing, we knew we had enough money to get something done. So that's what we, we did and you'll see in the video. Um, this is a list of just some of the people that needed to come together to make this happen. Our state Senator Shelley Short, Jacqueline Maycumber, Representative Joel Kretz, all three county commissioners we used a lot of local businesses to help get the work done. Um, it was the, the Caldwell Confederated Tribe was just amazing in how fast they helped us get through the cultural resource process so that we could proceed with this project um, and, and help improve some of the, uh, the, the stop some of the basically the, the deaths that were occurring with vehicle accidents and deer. So in one 12 mile stretch, 350 deer a year get killed right now. As of this day, with the completion of this project, we hope to lower that by anywhere from 80 to 100 deer per year. So this was an amazing thing that we were able to get done. I can't thank all the people and partners that helped make it happen enough. All right, so we're going to share just a quick three-minute video about this first phase of the Safe Passage 97 project. After that, we'll talk a little bit more about what might be coming next as far as efforts to secure public funding for the rest of this project in the Okanagan Valley, which includes wildlife undercrossings, fencing, and other infrastructure to protect both people and wildlife. And then I see some great questions coming in on the chat about beavers and some of the wildlife areas in the central part of the sage lands and volunteering, and we'll get to those at the end as well. So just bear with me here while we switch over to the video. First phase of the Safe Passage 97 project is completed. Deer fence, cattle guards, and underpass. been here working with different folks for the last five or six years. We have a project called Working for Wildlife. We try to balance the needs of wildlife and the people that use the land and new projects that are good for both. One of the bottlenecks and those pinch points that we knew right when we started that project was this particular area here, Highway 97. There's a ton of science that supports this spot is the main connection between the Cascades and the Rockies. Wildlife pass through here, all kinds of different species, and it's evident by the amount of deer that are killed on this highway every year. 350 deer a year are killed in this one 12 mile stretch of the highway. Living in this area, most people that I know have hit a deer on this highway. It's just famous for people having vehicle accidents. Each deer that's killed on this highway spends $7,000. That's the value they put on that deer loss and the accident and the insurance and the hospital bills and the state patrol showing up. We're putting about $2 million down the hole every year not doing this to 
because it's going to take a few million dollars to fix it, it's worth it. Just this side of Janus Bridge, and I see this deer jump up in the middle of the road out of the orchard. The first contact the deer made with the truck was up here on the passenger side. He hit the visor and the windshield, and he came in and beat the crap out of me and took the back of the cab out. This is the steering wheel off of that truck, and I'm pretty sure the steering wheel probably saved my life. What we got done this summer was put in all these coats for a mile, and we had three tenths of fence built, funneling deer towards Janus Bridge. Then we made improvements at Janus Bridge in the distance there, so deer could pass under it. So as soon as we put the fence in and improved the underpass, we started seeing animals come under the bridge. We've seen cougar, we've seen countless numbers of deer, does, bucks, coyotes, bobcats, a skunk, a couple of old tomcats, and they continually use this all night long, all day long, in the morning, in the evening. They're going back and forth from food sources and water sources. It's amazing how many animals are already using what we've built here. So to be standing here today and seeing how this is working, the fence, the underpass, it's just a testament to all the people that gave to this project. Over 570 donors from Conservation Northwest, five Mueller Foundation chapters from around the state, all giving their dollars to make sure this could happen. There's a huge amount of partners that were involved. Department of Transportation has been great to work with, Department of Wildlife, and the Colville Confederated Tribes were amazing to support this project and enable us to get it on the ground in a timely manner. A whole host of people made this happen and we've got to give you all a lot of thanks. That was great, Chase. Thank you. I wanted to say one thing to everybody, if everybody can still hear me. Am I good, Chase? Yeah, I think so, Jay. Yeah, I just wanted to say, you know, when we raised this, these dollars from all you folks that you know, gave to this, um, and then we found out we didn't, couldn't put in the first underpass, we didn't have enough, we were kind of stuck. We were like, well, what, what do we do now? And it was really cool because everybody I work with are what if people that said, well, what if, what if? What if we just improved Janus Bridge? Could we build a fence and would they use it and drive it to there? So um, we were able to take those, you know, hard-earned dollars that you gave us, those, those, those donations, and put it to a use that even surprised us how well it worked. And we think we're going to just see benefits from that for years to come and hopefully move into further getting, uh, getting more fence down further south from there. Yeah, thank you, Jay, and thanks everyone for tuning in. I'm sorry about the audio at the beginning and the typing noise that was apparently coming through. There's a link in the chat to the YouTube version of this video as well as it's up on Facebook and on our website, so plenty of other ways to watch the piece. But essentially, we wrapped up this first phase of the project. We had to get creative, as Jay said, and we did that pitching in with a whole bunch of partners when Olympia failed to come through with state funding. But we're not done. There's quite a bit left in the Safe Passage 97 project, a little bit over 12 miles between Riverside and Tenasket, where those 350 deer a year are killed, as Jay mentioned. And we, we really want to work with state legislators and budget leaders with the Department of Transportation to get the rest of this effort done. And I'm going to share a map here in just a second that'll show a few of the other places where we'd like to see wildlife under crossings and where really an appalling amount of wildlife vehicle collisions have been recorded. So we'll talk about that for just a minute. And um, then we'll talk about some of the, the questions that have come through and any of the other elements that folks are interested in. Just give me one second here. I would point out too that deer tend to be the ones that you notice the most or elk when they get hit on a highway. But you know, this permeable landscape and underpasses under highways protects all kinds of wildlife. And you saw that in the amount of uh, wildlife that was using Janus Bridge from turkeys to skunks to badgers to uh, raccoons and you know all kinds of different wildlife. So this map shows the full extent of the Safe Passage 97 project. As I mentioned it's about 12.9 miles or just under 13 miles from Riverside to 
to Tenasket in the Okanagan Valley. The focus of work up to this point through this first private phase has been from the Janus Bridge and a mile south, and that's what you saw in the video. But here on this map, there's quite a few other places where we're working with Washdot and the Department of Transportation, um, the Department of Fish and Wildlife and the Colville Tribes and other partners. We've identified proposed wildlife underpasses and then also areas where there was a, a really high level of deer carcass removal that just underscores the need for this project. Jay, one question that we got is um, wanting to know a little bit more about the, the costs for these, the rest of this project, the underpasses and the fencing and why, um, you know, what, why the, every, every piece of it is important. Could you share a little bit more about what we have scoped out for the rest of this project? You bet. Um, basically, it can get expensive. When you put an underpass in, there's a, there's a pretty good cost, three four $400,000 just for that underpass. Of course, then you have to have it installed. There's crews, there's, there's flagging crews, and uh, that can get very expensive too if you have to put a bypass road in around the uh, construction site. Um, fencing is, doesn't come cheap. Um, we were able to get a lot done with the money we had. We just were able to, to move fairly quickly and get some good contractors um, into the future. If this project goes forward, I think a reasonable cost that you can consider would be about $2 million per mile protected. That means underpasses, deer gates, cattle guards. Cattle guards have to happen at every road that comes in so deer to the highway so the deer can't get onto the highway. People would say, wow, that's a lot of money. Um, Lloyd Caton, I know pretty good, and who got in that accident, said, you know, a million dollars might be a lot of money, but I think a life is worth that, don't you? And sooner or later, if we don't do something, somebody's going to get killed. Plus, as, as was mentioned in the video, the year that goes by, we're really spending about $2 million just handling the accidents that occur now. That's vehicle repairs. Uh, value of that deer for wildlife viewing or hunting, um, response teams, someone to go out and clean the deer up off the road. So, you know, 2 million miles a year kind of thrown away or 18 million spent over a few years to protect this and, and, and save all this wildlife and create this permeable landscape. Yeah, and that, that permeable landscape is a point I, I want to underscore really quickly. You know, it's, it's important to keep deer off the highway. It's important for the deer's lives as well as the safety of motorists. But when we look at this landscape in the Okanagan Valley and from the North Cascades to the Kettle Range to the Rocky Mountains, we really are working for permeability. So just fencing the highway, while it might be a short-term solution, that's not a solution in the long run for mule deer that need to move in their seasonal migrations or, or their daily migrations in some cases to find food and water. It's not a solution for lynx that need to, we want, we want to connect up Canada lynx populations that are in the North Cascades as well as the Kettle Range. We want to provide connectivity across this landscape and that's where the wildlife crossings are essential. So we're going to continue putting pressure on state legislators in Olympia, working with local elected leaders from the Okanagan Valley and getting it out there that this project is a win-win for people and wildlife in the long term. It's, it's likely to save our state money. And not only is it important for deer and driver safety, but it's important for connecting up this landscape on a larger scale, for connecting the Cascade to the Rockies and providing habitat connectivity into the future. Um, this here is a, a great picture of deer that we're using this crossing just a few weeks ago. And um, you know, Jay, hats off to you. It's really been amazing to see how wildlife are responding so quickly to this crossing and, and we're hopeful that that'll continue to happen in the future. I'd like to give one more shout out to uh, our local Mule Deer Foundation chapter here in Okanagan Trails Mule Deer Foundation chapter that has stood up and made this their signature project and every banquet and every dollar we raise, you know, we can say it's going for good use and I think all of our our members and donors in that chapter are, are really proud of this project, as well as from around the state, as well as a whole bunch of other people, backcountry hunters and anglers, um, you know, a whole bunch of organizations, and then of course all the individual donations that came in from all of you.
you know, Audubon Washington, National Wildlife Federation, Colville Tribes, and it was really impressive to see the support that rallied behind this project. And we want to keep that support going as we go back to Olympia, show them this success and say, you know, there's a lot that can be done here. You'll get a big bang for your buck and we want to see more investment in the Safe Passage 97 project. Um, one more thing on wildlife crossings generally before we, we go back, back a level and go back up to the Sagelands program that Jay leads. Uh, one of the questions here was about how Washington compares to other states when it comes to wildlife crossing projects and habitat connectivity. You know, Conservation Northwest worked for more than a decade on the I-90 Snoqualmie Pass East project. We helped drove that initiative through our I-90 wildlife corridor campaign, lobbying in Olympia and with partners for funding for I-90 wildlife crossings. And, you know, I think the, the person who left this comment in the chat made a good point that many other states are far ahead of Washington when it comes to the number of wildlife crossings and Canada probably has us all beat. But when you look at the way that Washington's wildlife crossings have been designed, it's not as a single crossing, but as ecosystem connectivity or connectivity at a landscape scale. On I-90, we have well over two dozen crossings of various sizes. One large wildlife overcrossing that has been completed and another that's in the works. And so you have multiple options for animals to move from the north to the south Cascades over a 15 mile stretch. And that's very similar to what we're proposing here in the Okanagan Valley. We know there's a problem with wildlife collisions. We don't just wanna see this one crossing at Janus Bridge, as exciting as it is to see deer like these three using it. We wanna see landscape scale connections that protect drivers and connect up these ecosystems across the valley from the North Cascades to the Kettle Range and beyond. And so in that sense, you know, we might be behind other states as far as the number of wildlife crossings, but the scale and science behind our crossings is something that's really impressive and something that we at Conservation Northwest, along with our partners, want to keep driving forward. I'd add one more thing, Chase, and that is that we may not have as many, but we've dealt with so many more situations and problems to get the ones we have. We have so many more people in places that we need crossings than any other state. And I've traveled through Montana and Idaho and British Columbia, Utah, and seen a lot of great crossing work that is doing great work. But there's very few landowners out along those highways. I'd say, you know, a third to a half of the time it took to get these in place has been working with the tremendous amount of people that exist along the right of way, as well as the partners needed to get the job done. So you know, I'm, one of the things I'm real proud of is the, the relationships we've formed with a lot of the landowners who this will benefit as well. And if you think about it, every driveway that comes off a, off a main highway has to have a cattle guard. That's a bunch of discussions that go on um, that you don't necessarily have to do in a place like Wyoming or Montana where it's pretty much open range. That's a great point, Jay. We had one more question about, uh, I'll, I'll combine two questions for you. One was, what sort of monitoring and ongoing analysis is happening at the Janus Bridge site and in the first phase of the Safe Passage 97 project um, to help inform decision makers, project leaders, and partners about how well it's working? And then the second part of the question is, how can folks get involved? Is there any volunteering that's planned? Um, the first question, of course, cameras are the ultimate tool to measure your success. Um, we're showing about 2,000 pictures of animals crossing under um, Janus Bridge every month. Now, some of these are the same animals coming and going at different days or whatnot. But that's a tremendous amount of use um, that is being documented, you know, each day that these cameras are being operated. Um, other data that will come in will be the roadkill data. So the carcass removal data, Department of Transportation sends crews out to remove uh, dead animals along the road and they track those and we have that data. So it shouldn't be too long before we have enough data to show, you know, pre-fencing, pre-underpass, post, let's see what's happening and, and how good we're doing. Um, some of the other information um, would also come through the, uh, uh, where you can pick up uh, roadkill now. So that information is pinned on a map that's added into that data to show where deer are getting hit or not hit. So we'll have several ways to look at 
you know, and measure our success on this project. Um, next month, there's going to be a, a meeting up on the Methow Highway um, to look at that and some of the areas that are being uh, considered for possible solutions is what we did here. So there's we're a lot of research talk. going on on that particular highway. Thank you, Jay. Thank you. We're going to talk a little bit more about the Sage Lands Heritage Program as a whole at the end, and we'll try to answer a few more questions. But now I want to turn it over to Matthew Brower just to say a few words about this project and his work on it. Matthew's our development director here at Conservation Northwest, and um, a whole lot of folks pitched in to make this happen. So, Matthew, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, wonderful. Sure. This is the point in the evening where if you have a glass and you have a beverage, you should raise it. We'll imagine all of you out there together uh, doing a toast like back in the good old days when we could all gather together, uh, which we'd certainly be doing in a, in a normal year. Um, so yeah, you know, many people have already been thanked by, by Chase and, and Jay, and you've seen the slide, but this was a huge effort by, by so many partners. I'll just take a, a moment to kind of summarize uh, the scope of that. Um, as was referenced in the video, uh, Jay saying over 570 uh, donors total project. And I actually think we're probably over 600 some um, in, in actuality and over $180,000 uh, in total that made this happen. Um, it started as a campaign in 2018 um, and really contributions have continued to come in really till this spring. Uh, people hearing about the project, people seeing the progress updates and wanting to pitch in a little more uh, to see it through to the end. Um, and I think this is a prime example for how we like to do our, our projects in the community and how we like to fund them in terms of being a combination of funding from uh, the local community, uh, from the state and wide in general, and even some national funders like Cabela's uh, Bass Pro Shops. You know, we, we had regional foundations um, chip in, local foundations like the Community Foundation of North Central Washington that also ran a, a wonderful crowd fund campaign for us many local supporters, many people who probably never been through that stretch of highway, uh, Highway 97 around OMAC, um, who saw, saw what was happening, wanted to pitch in and, and help make it happen. Um, and this was anchored by some very significant contributions. You saw some of them, we'll see some of them on the slide, um, and you know, dozens and dozens of smaller contributions, everything from $10 to $10,000 and even beyond that. So all of those, uh, coming together to, to make what, what happened possible here. Um, and I'm in the development office, so I, I get to open the mail. It's always a fun job. It's the funnest part of the job is opening the mail and seeing what treasure, you know, treasure and prizes have come in uh, for us that, that funds this work. And this one was fun, just kind of seeing the ongoing support come in. And, and one day it would be opening a letter and it's from a, a bridge club out of Quincy that meets weekly and plays cards together and they support local causes and we got picked as the local co cause. They'd heard about the project and, and wanted to fund Project uh, uh, Highway 97. And uh, get an email from, from Jay about Spokane Audubon Society wanting to pitch in or uh, another letter from a Zookeepers Association out of Tacoma uh, wanting to pitch in or an, uh, a longtime member uh, who's made a special gift in addition to what they typically do because uh, we got a progress update and we're excited about us getting close to completing it. So this project has elicited a lot of passion from, from many different people, local, statewide. Uh, so it's been exciting to see that happen. So thank you. And no, no doubt many of you on this call have pitched in uh, to support this project and to support our work in general. So thank you to you. Uh, thank you to the whole Conservation North uh, West community who's who stepped up to to bring this together. Um, and I just want to want to thank Jay too. Jay's really poured his heart and soul into this for now, um, you know, more than a year. And he's had lots of twists and turns on it, but always found a way through it uh, to make it happen. So he deserves some thanks as well as, as all the Conservation Northwest staff who, who've been a part of it. Um, and this, I think it's probably been referenced tonight, but also just to note that apart from the immediate impact of the project, which is significant, uh, you know, the, the lessening in, in vehicle collisions and the, the lives of animals saved, uh, the connectivity improvement. A lot of learning gets done with a project like this. Uh, by our staff, uh, it gets done by members in the community who, who talk about it and share it, it ripples out into other communities and also from agencies like WashDOT uh, that informs how they're gonna do this kind of work on future projects and helps us to continue to create change. So uh, again, thank you so much uh, for being part of that. And, 
uh, raise a glass to, to F-97 connections to, to mule deer uh, and to our ongoing work making safer highways for both people uh, and wildlife. Thank you so much, Matthew. I'm going to turn it back over to you in just a minute to talk about uh, a few of the, the membership programs we have coming up and maybe our next event. But before we do that, um, two quick things. One, you know, there's a lot of, there was a lot of times in this work where we as an organization and all of our partners could have hung up our hats and walked away. We had hoped through two different legislative sessions to secure state funding. And the fact that we were able to get creative and Jay was able to really become a project manager for over a year to get this done is, is really inspiring. And I hope it translates into the full project getting funded this coming session. So please do keep an eye out this fall and particularly once the legislative session starts in January, we'll be sending out some action alerts and talking points, ways to contact your state legislators on behalf of the Safe Passage 97 project and funding in the state transportation budget for this initiative, but also for other wildlife crossing projects across our state. I mean, as you all know, there's a, a budget crisis as a result of the pandemic. Things are gonna be tight in Olympia this year. But there are also opportunities. We need good jobs improving our infrastructure, green infrastructure, infrastructure that supports wildlife and ecosystems as well as motorists and communities. And we think projects like Safe Passage 97 are a perfect example of that. So you'll be seeing some action alerts and other content from us about this effort, but also on transportation funding as a whole and how we can support good jobs and local communities, local economies, as well as wildlife and wildlife crossings. So, Stay tuned for that. More to come this fall and into the legislative session this winter. Jay, anything else you want to say on the Safe Passage 97 project or about how this fits into the Sagelands Heritage Program? Um, I realized I did forget the part of a question was uh, volunteering. So our organization was, loves to have volunteers. Of course, in these times with COVID, it's become a little hard to, to make that all happen, but there'll be a time when we get back to that. And you can get a hold of me um, through our website um, or send an email to our uh, central office and they'll get it get you in touch with me and we usually have uh, things turn up anytime from spring to late fall where we might be, have volunteer groups to remove barbed wire fence um, plant seed on disturbed areas help with rehabilitation on wildlife areas with the department of wildlife um, take out uh, things that are causing problems for permeability for for wildlife there's a number of different things that can happen. We've had some workshops where people came and volunteered to help us build these uh, rock structures called Z-dike structures that help uh, put more wet, wet uh, meadows back in the landscape for species. So we do have a lot of things going on. Like I said, it might be a little while before we get back up on the big volunteer efforts, but we do have them and we look forward to working with all of you on that. One, that's a good segue into one other question we had earlier that I'd love to give you just a minute to answer, Jay, which is, you know, we've talked a lot about the work in the northern end of the connected backbone linkage that is the priority of the Sagelands Heritage Program. But there's also a lot going on in the, the central part of that linkage around Ellensburg and Yakima and some of the state wildlife areas like the Kalakum and Weynes. Could you tell us a little bit about some of the work that you've done down in that landscape? Um, around Vantage or some of the areas down there? Yeah, a um, couple different things. And there's that's kind of a big area for road uh, decommissioning or closures. Roads have such an impact, especially in some of our wildlife areas that we, we look for those opportunities and try to jump on those and help where we can, either with dollars or volunteers or program assistance. Um, uh, we've been really working to try to help create uh, uh, rangelands protection districts that could help with an initial attack on fires because fires that can occur, for instance, coming off the Yakima Training Center can be you know, mega fires and, and cause quite a bit of damage. So we're looking at ways to help um, with suppress some of those big mega fires from the start. Uh, we've been talking with uh, the, the uh, Yakima Firing Center or Training Center, um, high escalons in the army about ways that uh, the elk um, might be able to be put under the, high, under the freeway I-90, because um, there's a lot of uh, elk get killed on that stretch of, of uh, freeway. So there's different things happening down there. Um, 
and I wanted to mention real quick too, up north in Canada, while we don't have a huge presence up there, we have been really um, help, helping and being a part of the process to help create the uh, South Okanagan, Okanagan Smokemi National Park Network has worked on this, the sage, or excuse me, the uh, Grasslands uh, Park Reserve. It's a national park up in Canada. And that's been moving along for about 15 years and it, it's really looking positive now that that would be a huge core area of sage lands and shrub step habitat that we would be tying into um, coming from the south. Thank you, Jay. And I, um, I think I mentioned this earlier, but it's worth saying again, we have versions of all these maps and many of the photos, some of the science that went into the connectivity maps that we shared and a whole bunch more information on our website under the Sagelands Heritage Program webpage. We've got some good information there about the work that Jay's doing on the Yakima Firing Center, that big military installation south of I-90 that actually provides some incredible habitat for sageland species. Information about some of the work happening on state wildlife areas around Ellensburg, all the way up to the Safe Passage 97 project in the Okanagan Valley. Um, I think we've answered most of the questions that have popped up here. And I do want to save another moment at the end for Matthew. If there's anything we missed, feel free to put it into the chat. Um, I did see one question about beavers, and, and Jay, you talked a little bit about beaver dam analogs and some of the water retention work you're doing with partners to help restore wetlands to the arid sage lands. Are you doing any work with live beavers, or is it mostly just mimicking their dams at this point? Well, as uh, some of the trainers on the, on the Z-Dike structures say um, about beavers, build it and they will come. So basically, we're trying to create the habitat that would bring back beaver because they do a lot of good things in nature. And uh, so that's one of the main things we're doing there. I'd also quickly like to mention that it's, it's usually about the habitat and usually about the permeability, but at some point, some species just need help. So we're, we've been involved in helping to translocate sharp-tailed grouse from Canada um, into the Tunk area where sharp-tailed grouse are an endangered species in our state. Um, we're working with possibilities of translocating trans, uh, some lynx um, onto the reservation. And of course, the Colville tribe and the Yakima Nation um, are both um, working on antelope uh, reintroduction programs that we've been um, thinking about and figuring out trying to ways to help them if they can, if they need that. Thank you, Jay. And thanks for everyone for tuning in. I, I did want to just reiterate one thing. Michelle had asked, you know, what's the key to getting funding from the state for the rest of the Safe Passage 97 project and in addition to grassroots support from all of you and, and our whole community this fall and winter part of the key is going to be making sure that legislators across the state see this not only as a win-win a, a safety project for people and wildlife but as a good thing for the community good thing for our state as a whole and that's that's why we're going to be pitching not just this project but green infrastructure funding through the transportation budget for the Safe Passage 97 project and for other wildlife crossing opportunities around the state. You know, this is a way we can create local jobs and send money to local contractors while also improving our transportation infrastructure and connecting large landscapes for wildlife. So if there's one thing that we have to do, we've got the local legislators on board, it's we have to convince other leaders in Olympia that this project matters and it matters well outside the Okanagan Valley for the state as a whole and for as an example for other wildlife crossings. So stay tuned for more information on that. Um, Matthew, I want to turn it over to you to talk a little bit more about our photo contest in Members Month and some of the things that are coming down the pipe. Sure, I'll be real brief here, but uh, uh, we still have a few more days that you can submit for our Wild Northwest Photo Contest. Uh, if you see the link at the bottom of the page there, you can go to our website also um, and click on the blog section under News, Wild Northwest Blog, and you'll see our post on that, which will get you to the link on how to submit a photo. Uh, we're accepting photos in the uh, wildlife and landscape categories. So definitely if you got some good picks from this summer or from the past, uh, submit those to that. We'd love a few more entries. Um, and your photo, if it's selected, will be uh, created and put into a gift print that will go out to anybody who becomes a member in September. And then regardless, we'll, we'll be using these photos if you submit to them um, as part of, we'll feed them into our communications and into some of our 
uh, external work. So your shot might be might be used as part of uh, conservation Northwest promotion in ways that we're promoting promoting our work uh, around the around the region. Um, and then September is Members Month. So just a couple things we're featuring. Then uh, we have our Go Wild Trivia Night on September 16th. That'll be another a virtual event. Uh, we're putting together the pieces on that. We've got a fun night planned, some great trivia. Um, the registration for that uh, will be going out shortly, um, so keep your eye out for that. Um, we'll be breaking people out into teams. It'll be randomly put together with uh, other Conservation Northwest members, um, so this will be a fun chance to test your skills and, and be with other Conservation Northwest members, um, yeah, doing some wildlife and wild lunch trivia. And uh, there's also incentives that we have built into Members Month. So anybody who makes a gift at uh, $35 or more gets one of these gift prints, which we're still to see what the, the winning image will be. And we're also giving away uh, Conservation Northwest t-shirts and uh, a cool grizzly bear mug that we've, uh, we're, we're creating. Um, and those are based on if you get friends and family to join as well. So it's based on a referral system. Uh, if you make three gifts or three referrals, you get the t-shirt and then the, the gift print. If you make five referrals, you get the, the grizzly mug. Uh, and if you're a super all-star and get eight referrals, you get the mug, t-shirt, and the gift print. I know I start, I'm starting to sound like an AMBO um, promotions person, but that's what you got before you. It's a one-time uh, chance to get the, the, the camp grizzly mug. Um, so we hope you take part and hope you take part in uh, the trivia night on the 16th. I think that's that's all I got. I'll turn it back over to Chase. Thank you, Matthew, and thank you, for, thank you everyone for tuning in. A um, lot of important work going on right now in Washington State, across the Pacific Northwest, and across the country. So, you know, it's not really our, I think someone said in the chat, it's not our job to tell you who to vote for or where to engage, but please think about wildlife, think about public lands, and think about habitat when you do go to the polls this fall. Feel free to check out our website for more on the Sage Lands Heritage Program and the Safe Passage 97 Project, and a bunch of other great conservation initiatives happening in Washington State and Southern British Columbia. And look out for information on our next webinar coming in late September. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone.